Welcome to this HP Expert One presentation. This is the second video discussing VLANs. In the previous video, we looked at the basics of VLANs and how to configure and set up access ports or untagged ports. In this video, we'll extend the discussion by discussing 802.1Q tagging, inter-VLAN routing, and other VLAN-related topics. Let's get started. Now, trunk or tag ports once again allow multiple VLANs to traverse a single link. There is one untagged VLAN and multiple tagged VLANs. There are two ways to do this. Either using 802.1Q, which is an industry standard, or a proprietary method called ISL. ISL is Cisco's proprietary method and tends not to be used these days. 802.1Q is the industry standard and is the preferred choice for communicating information between switches across trunk or tag ports. So let's look at 802.1Q in more detail. Now in this picture we have a standard Ethernet frame as well as an 802.1Q frame. What you'll notice is an 802.1Q frame has an extra field, the tag field. Hence, when we talk about an untagged frame, an untagged frame, which is a standard Ethernet frame, does not contain the tag field. When 802.1Q is used, a 4-byte tag is inserted in the Ethernet header between the source address and the ether type or length field. So in standard Ethernet, we have the destination and source address, the length or ether type, data, and a frame check sequence. On editor 1Q, on the other hand, we have the destination and source address, the tag that's inserted between the source address and the length ether type, the data, and a new frame check sequence because the frame has been altered and thus a new frame check sequence needs to be recomputed and needs to replace the previous frame check sequence in the modified frame. Now the tag field consists of two main parts. We have what's called the tag protocol identifier, which is set to 0x8100 in hexadecimal. And this identifies that the frame is an 802.1Q tagged frame. There are many type fields available in Ethernet. So if we're using Ethernet 2, the Ether type will denote the higher layer protocols. In standard Ethernet, 0x800 indicates that the higher layer protocol is IP version 4. However, in 802.1Q, the frame has changed. So this identifier identifies that this is an 802.1Q frame rather than a standard Ethernet frame with higher layer protocols. So switches, when receiving an 802.1Q frame, know that they need to read the 802.1Q information. In other words, treat the frame differently from a standard Ethernet frame. So this would be an untagged frame once again, and this is a tagged frame with 802.1Q information contained within the tag. The first 16 bits is the TPID or tag protocol identifier and the remaining 16 bits or two bytes is broken up as follows. Once again, not to scale. Three bits represent the priority or priority code point also known as the class of service or cost bits. These are used to prioritize certain types of traffic over others and are used very heavily in quality of service. Where for example, a value of five represents voice. The canonical format identifier was used in the old days for compatibility between ethernet and token ring networks. It's very unlikely that you're gonna use this today. And the most important piece for this discussion is the 12-bit VLAN identifier, which allows one switch to indicate to another switch the VLAN to which this frame belongs. If it has a value of zero, that would mean that this frame does not belong to any VLAN. But as an example, the default VLAN is VLAN one on switches, so this value would be set to one. Once again, it's 12 bits in size, 
So 2 to the power of 12 equals 4096. In theory, 4096 VLANs are supported by 8 to the 1 Q. So going back to our topology, we've got two switches, switch 1 and switch 2. These ports are configured as access ports or untagged ports in the relevant VLANs. A and D are in the red VLAN. C and B on the green VLAN and the link between the two switches is configured as an 802.1Q trunk or tagged port. Once again when working on the Conway operating system it's called a trunk port and when working on the provision operating system it's known as a tag port. This is the physical topology of the network however the logical topology is very different. Logically we have four switches. Switch 1 has devices in the red VLAN and the green VLAN and so does switch 2. A and D are in the red VLAN and B and C are in the green VLAN. Let's assume that A is sending a frame to D. So the source address of the frame is A, the destination address is D. That frame would then be sent to switch 1 as an untagged frame. Remember these are access ports or untagged ports. There is no 802.1Q tag between A and switch 1. The PC is unaware of the fact that it's been put into a separate VLAN. When the frame is received by the switch, in this case switch 1, the switch is going to determine the outgoing interface based on the destination address in the frame. So let's assume that the MAC address tables of the switches are filled. In other words, on switch 1, the MAC address table contains the following entries. A is on port 01, D is on port 03. That means that when the frame is received by the switch, it's going to internally tag the frame as red and then send the frame to the egress interface. Now before transmission out of that interface, it's going to remove the internal tag and then forward the frame externally as an 802.1Q frame because this is an 802.1Q tag port or trunk port. Now the frame will only be sent out as an 802.1Q frame with these values if the VLAN is permitted on that port. Now when configuring switches, be aware that on HP switches only VLAN 1 is permitted by default. You have to explicitly permit the other VLANs on the trunk or tag port. On Cisco switches the VLANs are permitted by default. But on HP switches you have to explicitly permit the VLAN. So in this case the frame arrived as a untagged frame. It was tagged internally as a red VLAN. The frame was copied from the ingress port to the egress port. On egress, the switch would check that the trunk port, in other words 03, permits the red VLAN and in switches it's done on number rather than color. The internal tag would be stripped. The frame would then be forwarded as an edited or 1Q frame out of the interface 03 and an edited or 1Q tag would be inserted including the VLAN number. In this example we're using a VLAN identifier of red. But as mentioned in the real world it's based on numbers but here we're using colors to keep it simple and visual. So the frame traverses this link and arrives at switch 2 as an 802.1Q frame tagged with the VLAN identifier, in this case the red VLAN. Switch 2 would receive the frame and read the VLAN identifier as well as the destination address of the frame. The switch will also have a MAC address table. So on switch 2, it would for example have a MAC address table stating that D is on port 02. So the switch knows that it needs to send that frame out of port 2. However, when the frame arrives on this port, it's an edited a 1Q frame. The edited a 1Q tag will be removed and an internal tag would be added to the frame. 
marking that this is a red frame. When the frame goes out of port 02, all internal tags are removed and the frame goes out as a standard Ethernet frame. PCA and PCD are unaware of the fact that they've been put into VLANs. They are sending traffic as untagged Ethernet frames and receiving it as untagged Ethernet frames. The devices are unaware of the fact that the traffic between the switches was sent as a tagged 802.1Q frame. Now to enable trunk or tag ports on an HP switch running the provision operating system, you would type enable, configure, specify a VLAN, in this case VLAN 1. In this case VLAN 1 is going to be the untagged VLAN or native VLAN or PVID on port A1. So we use the command untag A1. A1 being an interface number or port number on the switch. In this example, I'm assuming that I'm using a modular switch running the provision operating system. You would then specify other VLANs, such as VLAN 2, and then tag it on the same port. So tag A1, then VLAN 3, and tag that VLAN on port A1. And you would just continue with this process. If you needed to permit VLAN 10, across port A1, you would type VLAN 10 tag A1. So that's an example of how you configure tag ports on an HP switch running the provision operating system. To do something similar on a switch running the Conway operating system, you would type system view. Create your VLANs. VLAN 1 is created by default, but in this case the command VLAN 123 would create the additional VLANs 2 and 3. Then you specify the interface to make a trunk port. So interface gigabit ethernet 101 in this example. Specify the port type as trunk. So port link type trunk. By default, the native or PVID VLAN is VLAN 1. But the command to change that would be port trunk PVID VLAN and the VLAN number. So this command is there by default, but I'm just showing it for completeness. And then you need to specify the VLANs that are permitted across this trunk. So port trunk permit VLAN 1 to 3. That's how you configure a trunk port on an HP switch running the Conway operating system. HP switches can be configured to support IP phones. In a scenario like this, tag frames are sent to the phone. So the phone could be in VLAN 10, for example. Untagged frames are sent between the switch and the PC through the phone, so the PC could be in VLAN 20. In this case, VLAN 20 is the untagged or native or PVID VLAN, and the tagged VLAN is VLAN 10. Tagged frames are sent between the phone and the switch, untagged frames between the PC and the switch. The configuration of voice VLANs varies depending whether you're working on a device using Provision or Comware, but the same premise is generally used. Tagged frames are sent to the phone and untagged frames are sent to the PC. This allows you to have two devices on a single port in different VLANs. So how do devices communicate between VLANs? Going back to our simple topology of a single switch, with devices in two VLANs, how do we allow device A to communicate with device C? Now VLANs are separate subnets. So this device might have an IP address of 10.1.1.1 and this device might have an IP address of 10.1.2.1 in different subnets. How do they communicate with each other? Now in the past, the switch may have been a layer 2 switch and thus an external router was required to do the inter-VLAN routing. A router is a layer 3 device, a switch is a layer 2 device in the OSI model, and thus the router would be connected to the switch, and it would do the inter-VLAN routing. So once again, if device A with IP address 10.1.1.1 wanted to communicate with device C with an IP address of 10.1.2.1, device A would send that traffic to the router and the router would do an inter-VLAN route and send the traffic to device C. 
Now for that to work, additional configuration would need to be done. This interface between the switch and the router would be configured as an 802.1Q trunk or tagged port, allowing the red VLAN and green VLAN to traverse that 802.1Q trunk. The router would be configured with multiple sub-interfaces. So for argument's sake, let's assume that this interface is gigabit 00. The router would be configured with sub-interfaces. So like gigabit 00.1, and it would have an IP address of let's say 10.1.1.100 in the same subnet as device A. The router would have a second sub-interface with an IP address of 10.1.2.100. In other words, an IP address in the same subnet as device C. So device A's default gateway would be this IP address on the router and device C's default gateway would be this IP address on the router. Once again, when A wanted to communicate with C, it would do a logical AND on the network portion of the address. And in this case, let's assume you're using slash 24 masks, it would see that device C is in a different subnet to itself. And it would thus forward traffic to the default gateway. So A would send the traffic to the router. The router would route between the two sub-interfaces and send the traffic back to the switch. And the switch would forward the traffic to device C. It's important to note, however, that when the traffic is sent from the switch to the router, in other words, the traffic going from device A to the router, that's tagged as the red VLAN. When the router sends the traffic back to the switch, it's tagged as the green VLAN. So in addition to configuring the sub-interfaces with IP addresses, you also associate the VLAN number with the sub-interface. So interface gigabit 002 would be green and 001 would be red. The router changes the VLAN number when traffic is sent back to the switch. So in summary, these interfaces are untagged in the relevant VLANs, red and green. This interface is tagged on both the switch and the router. In other words, it's using 802.1Q. It's a trunk port to use the Comware term. Sub-interfaces are configured on the router with IP addresses and the VLAN numbers. Traffic sent between the switch and the router are tagged with the relevant VLANs. Traffic to the PCs are untagged. Now that works fine in a small environment, but it doesn't scale very well. It also incurs additional cost because two devices are now required. You need a layer two switch and a router. So rather than having an external router, in the past, special modules were inserted in switches. So as an example, you would have a management module managing the switch, and then you would have a router module inserted in a switch, but they two distinct entities. In other words, the management module would provide the layer two functionality and the router module would provide the layer three functionality. Traffic that needed to be routed would be sent from the layer two switch to the layer three router. It would be inter VLAN routed and sent back to the switch. That was taking place internally in the switch, but there were two distinct parts a management module and a router module. These days that's been enhanced even further. So we are taking the router and putting it inside the switch, but it's just different ASICs in the switch that provide the layer two functionality and layer three functionality. We don't have an entire module just providing layer three functionality. So today we have what are called layer three switches. A layer three switch provides layer two functionality and layer three functionality. This is hardware dependent, but on HP switches, a device as small as a 2610 can provide inter VLAN routing. To enable this on a switch running the provision operating system, you would type enable conf t IP routing to enable routing functionality and then you would specify your VLANs. So VLAN 2, let's say the red VLAN, and VLAN 3, 
let's say the green VLAN. You would simply put IP addresses on the VLAN interfaces, so IP address on VLAN 2 and IP address on VLAN 3, and that's all you need to do to enable inter-VLAN routing. So the switch would be configured with an IP address of let's say 10.1.2.100, the IP address on VLAN 2, and 10.1.3.100, the IP address on VLAN 3. PCA with IP address of 10.1.2.1, for argument's sake, would be configured with the default gateway of the switch, but in this case, this IP address, 10.1.2.100. PCC would be configured with the default gateway of the switch, but with this IP address. And that's how you can enable inter-VLAN routing on HP switches. Switches running the Conway operating system have IP routing enabled by default, and a similar type of configuration is done to enable inter-VLAN routing. So the moral of the story is, switches today provide layer 2 functionality and layer 3 functionality. Configuring a port as an untagged port or access port is a layer 2 function. VLANs are configured at layer 2. Configuring IP addresses and enabling inter-VLAN routing is a layer 3 function. Running routing protocols such as RIP and OSPF are layer 3 functions. A lot of switches in the HP portfolio provide layer 3 functionality. Have a look at the data sheets to see the features provided by individual switches. Now in the real world, this is a typical topology that you'll encounter. Switches at the access layer, the access layer being the switches that connect users and servers to the network, are often layer 2 switches. Switches at the core or distribution layer are layer 3 switches. The switches at the core provide inter-VLAN routing, security by implementing access control lists, and many other features. These ports are configured as access ports or untagged ports. Once again, access being the term on Comware, untagged, the term on provision. So as an example, this PC may be in VLAN 10, this PC in VLAN 20, this PC in VLAN 30, VLAN 40, VLAN 50, VLAN 60. So you would configure this interface, for example, in VLAN 30. These links are configured as trunk ports or tag ports, allowing multiple VLANs to traverse those uplinks from the access layer to the core layer. Inter-VLAN routing is configured on these switches as they are layer 3 switches. They may run routing protocols such as OSPF or RIP. They also run protocols such as VRRP or Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol, which you may know about already or you'll learn in your studies. They implement access control lists to, for instance, stop a user in VLAN 20 accessing devices in VLAN 30 and many other features. Now in this setup, if traffic needs to be sent from VLAN 10 to VLAN 30, it's sent across this link as untagged because this is an untagged port or access port. It's tagged with an 82.1Q tag specifying that this traffic is VLAN 10 when sent from switch 3 to switch 1. Switch 1 will do the inter-VLAN routing, will then send it as a tagged frame to switch 4, but in this case it's tagged as VLAN 30. The VLAN tag is stripped and it's forwarded as an untagged frame to the PC in VLAN 30. For this to work, you need to configure these as untagged ports, these links need to be configured as tag ports, and they need to be configured to allow the relevant VLANs. You need to configure the default gateway of the PCs as the core switches. You need to configure inter-VLAN routing on the core switches. And as mentioned, for redundancy, you would implement a protocol like VRRP, which essentially allows you to take care of the default gateway when one of these core switches goes down. VRRP and the other technologies are out of the scope of this video. So in this video I've explained VLANs. I've explained the logic behind VLANs. I've explained untagged ports and tagged ports. I've explained 802.1Q. I've shown you various examples 
including basic examples and this topology which you more than likely encounter in the real world. That concludes this video explaining the basics of VLANs or virtual local area networks. For more information please visit hp.com forward slash go forward slash expert one.